Hey, this is Justin from BreakingTheCRE.com, and in today's video, we're going to talk about the math behind commercial real estate risk. And with everything going on in the world today, many commercial real estate investors with lots of leverage on their properties are in danger of having to send those properties back to the lender. Now, unfortunately, we can't go back in time, but it would be helpful to know how to make better decisions as a real estate investor to make sure that you maximize your chances of success even during a recession or a downturn without losing your property in the process. So in today's video, we're gonna go over three of the most important measures of risk for commercial real estate investors who buy properties with debt and the math behind each. Now, if you're new here on this channel, we talk about real estate investing careers and real estate financial analysis. So if you're looking to break into the industry or do your first real estate investment deal, make sure to subscribe and hit the notification bell. Now, when times are good and the economy is booming, it's easy to think that more leverage is always better. And when property values, occupancy, and rents are all going up into the right every single year, it sounds great to just plug in higher leverage levels into your real estate financial model and see your returns skyrocket. And in times like these, many real estate investors will try to max out their leverage levels as much as they can to maximize debt proceeds from a lender and minimize the amount of equity they need to put in their deals. But unfortunately, times like this show us that more debt isn't always better for commercial real estate investors. So when you're going into a deal and putting debt on a property, what are the key metrics that you should be looking out for from a risk perspective and what should those numbers be? Well, first, and what most investors are looking at today with many tenants asking for rent deferrals is your break-even occupancy ratio. And this is the occupancy percentage at which the property is going to start producing negative cash flow, meaning that equity investors are going to have to come in and fund additional equity to fund the operations of the deal and pay that debt service. Now, even though this is called an occupancy percentage, this is really referring to the amount of tenants that are paying rent in your property. So for many commercial real estate operators right now, their buildings may be 95 to 100% leased, but with nationwide shutdowns, many investors are seeing far fewer tenants being able to pay rent than are actually occupying space and have contractual leases. So this number is really referring to the number of tenants that are paying rent at your deal. Now it's not surprising that the more debt you have on a property, the higher this break even occupancy ratio is going to be. And the higher your break even occupancy ratio is, the more dependent you are on higher occupancy rates and your tenants paying rent on time. So to calculate this on a deal, the calculation is really simple. To figure this out, you'll take your gross potential rental revenue on the deal, assuming that property was 100% occupied, and then you'll divide that by the sum of your total ordinary operating expenses and your debt service. And the result of this calculation is going to get you the number that is your break-even occupancy ratio. So if your gross potential rental revenue is $100,000 and your total ordinary operating expenses and debt service is $80,000, that means that your break-even occupancy percentage is 80%, meaning that that property needs to be at least 80% full and 80% of those tenants need to be paying rent in order for you to be in a cash flow neutral or positive situation. Now it's really important to do this analysis before you close on a deal and settle on your debt terms. And as part of this analysis, you're going to wanna make an educated assumption about how low you actually believe that occupancy might drop during your hold period. So for a 100 unit multifamily property, for example, you may do an analysis of local property occupancy rates during the last recession, and you might find that the lowest occupancy rates got were 85%. And with that, you could adjust your debt levels accordingly to make sure you have enough cushion between your actual break-even occupancy ratio and that 85% number. And with retail, office, and industrial tenants, especially for properties with large tenants that make up over 25% of the leasable area on the space, this becomes even more important because just one tenant either vacating or not being able to pay rent could mean a really quick drop to 75% occupancy, and that's assuming that 100% of your building was occupied and paying rent before. So in short, the lower the value this is, the safer you are when things get tough from a cash flow perspective. So aside from your break-even ratio, the second metric that you're gonna to wanna to take a look at is your debt service coverage ratio or DSCR. 
and the debt service coverage ratio measures how many times over your net operating income from the property can cover your debt service. Now this is a really big one because it shows you how much cushion you have in your net operating income before you're going to start having trouble paying your debt service every month. Now depending on leverage levels and loan products, most lenders like to see this at at least 1.2 or 1.3, meaning that the property's annual net operating income is 120 to 130% or more of the total annual debt service obligations on the deal. This is also a really good stress test to run from the borrower perspective to see how much your net operating income could drop before you would start having trouble paying your debt service from that net operating income. And the easiest way to run the math on this is to take the number one and divide that by your debt service coverage ratio, and that will tell you the percentage of today's operating income you would need to service that loan. So for example, with a DSCR of 1.3, your net operating income would need to drop to just under 77% of your current net operating income value in order to be in a break-even scenario. This means that if you own a property with $130,000 of annual net operating income and your annual debt service is $100,000, your net operating income can drop by about 23% before you start having trouble paying that debt service from your operating income. Now with this metric, the higher the DSCR, the less risk you're going to have on your deal and the less risk you're going to have to come out of your own pocket to pay your monthly loan payments if things get hard. Now finally, once you know your break-even ratio and your debt service coverage ratio, the last metric that you wanna take a look at is your loan-to-value or LTV ratio. And the loan-to-value ratio is calculated by taking your loan amount divided by the property's value. Now this isn't too important during your loan term and if you're not planning to sell the property, because in most cases, you won't have to immediately repay the loan if your property declines in value. But where this does get really important is when you're in a situation where your loan is maturing and you either have to refinance the property or you're forced to sell the property. And the easiest way to think about this scenario is with a sample property acquisition. So say you buy a property at $10 million with a 75% loan to value ratio, meaning that you have a $7.5 million loan on the deal when you buy it. And let's say the loan term is five years and the amortization is 30 years, meaning that you'll have a significant balloon payment at the end of that five year term when you have to pay that back in full. So in this scenario, even if you pay down $500,000 of loan principal during that time, you'd still have an outstanding loan balance of $7 million at the end of that five year term. Now the problem arises when that $10 million acquisition is no longer worth $10 million and the property value drops when you're looking to refinance. So if that property is now only worth $8 million and you owe $7 million on the loan, now you have a problem on your hands. So assuming you don't wanna sell at a loss, you may go to refinance the property. But if you refinance the property at that same 75% loan to value ratio at an $8 million valuation, your loan proceeds would only be $6 million here. And that means that those refinance proceeds cannot repay that full $7 million outstanding loan amount and you have $1 million that you would need to come out of pocket for. Now, most individuals don't have that kind of cash laying around and most small to mid-sized private equity firms don't have that cash or don't want to spend that cash at that time. So with the other option to sell, you're in a really tough spot as well. Since you went into the property with a $2.5 million equity position or $10 million minus $7.5 million of the loan amount, that equity position would drop by $1.5 million when you sold, assuming that $8 million valuation. And that's not even accounting for things like closing costs brokerage commissions. So with your LTV, this is another one where the lower your value, the less risk you have on the deal from a refinance and sale perspective if things go south. So at the end of the day, tough times are going to be tough times for real estate investors, but doing the right analysis beforehand and assessing your risk from a debt perspective can be a huge determining factor in whether or not you're able to weather the storm and keep your portfolio intact, or if you're going to be dealing with foreclosures and sending properties back to the lender. So I hope that was helpful. If you want to learn more about how to run different risk return metrics and how different debt levels are going to affect your main commercial real estate returns, I have a free real estate financial modeling crash course, and you can grab that in the link in the description below. And that's going to show you how real estate investors analyze deals. And you'll even be able to change things like debt levels and see how those returns are going to change over time. So I hope that was helpful. If you like this video and want to see more content like this, let me know by hitting the like button, subscribe to the channel and share this with anyone else who might find this helpful. Thanks so much for watching and I'll see you in the next video.